And so I think they're looking for different ways that they can do that and they can extract more from customers for the value that they're giving. And so I think some of the biggest themes that I've seen, I've seen a lot of companies get rid of their freemium plan, just fold freemium altogether. Welcome to GrowthMates, the place to connect with inspiring leaders to help you grow yourself and your product. Here you can learn how companies like Dropbox, Adobe, Amplitude, Canva, and many more are building excellent products and growth culture. Please press follow to support us and get new episodes. This time we talk to Rob Litterst, who is leading HubSpot Media and building an insightful newsletter about pricing in SaaS. We discuss his journey from sales to writing, the emerging trend of employee-generated content, and a lot of things connected to user-centric pricing. If you listen to this episode, you will learn about unethical pricing practices we should avoid, why companies started shifting from freemium to speed up monetization, and a dozen of newsletters that Rob recommends to stay informed on important industry news. If you find this show valuable, please share it with one of your colleagues or friends. It gives huge support to continue creating it. To receive all episodes right in your inbox, subscribe to katesuma.substack.com. With that, let's dive in after a couple of announcements. This episode is brought to you by AppCuse, the platform that helps you design, deploy, and test captivating onboarding experiences in minutes, not weeks. AppCuse created the Product Adoption Academy, which includes courses, templates, and examples to help you level up your product adoption and you can use it entirely for free. Check out the five-step growth flow review template, which I created to help companies connect growth hypotheses with behavioral patterns to uncover meaningful improvements. Find an example of Dropbox onboarding inside and use this template to review any growth flows in your product. Get the template through the link appcuse.com slash growthmates. appcuse.com slash growthmates. I have one exciting announcement for you. If you are keen on mastering product growth and activation, join the upcoming course, which starts on 15th of April. You will get a lot of frameworks to improve your onboarding and activation. Practice on two projects that should be connected to your ongoing product work. And most importantly, you will receive personalized feedback on your ideas directly from us. For dear listeners of this podcast, we provide a 15% discount Find the link in the episode description and use the promo code GROWTHMATES. And now, let's dive in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to GROWTHMATES. Hi, Rob. We are so happy to have you here today. How are you doing? So happy to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm doing great. Happy Friday. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks God it's Friday. (laughs) Thanks God it's Friday. What are you calling us from? I'm calling in from a suburb outside of Boston today. Nice. So it's it's a little bit cold, but it's actually a pretty nice day, relatively speaking. We're not quite into the terrible part of Boston winter quite yet. Probably when we will be posting this episode, it will be already like winter, January or February, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we are so happy to have you here today, and I think that your a beautiful newsletter speak for itself and the name of this newsletter is good better best i think we also had an episode with the same title with adam from atlassian who had this framework of good better best at atlassian for the design quality but anyways the idea of your newsletter is a bit different it's connected to pricing to SaaS. and also your actual full-time job is connected to newsletters so you're head of ops and newsletters at HubSpot, which is amazing. And today we'd like to talk to you about both uh, pricing, newsletters, and interesting combination of your side project, how it led to your full-time job. Absolutely. I'm excited to dig in. That That's really been pricing and newsletters has really kind of been where I've been spending all of my time for the last six years or so. So super excited to dive in and and talk more about it. I think SaaS is in a really interesting place right now where it's never been easier to start a SaaS company. And I think back in the day when there weren't as many SaaS companies, you could kind of get by with product alone. And then as more and more SaaS companies started entering the picture, I think 
product marketing and positioning became more and more important. And now I think as more and more SaaS companies pile on on top of that, there are different niches, et cetera. I think pricing is becoming more and more important when you're just in this massive market. So I think the companies that have a great product, great positioning, and pricing strategy that really resonates with their target market are going to be positioned to win. I think it's a combination of those three things that that is really kind of setting the best players in SaaS apart right now. 100%. But the more players, the harder it is, right? To, exactly. To survive. It's called Red Ocean, right? That's that that term. I don't remember the name of that book. What was the name of that book? Blue Oceans? Blue Ocean Strategy, I think, is, is that book. Yeah. Classic. Yeah, it's like a one of those yeah, one of those startup classics for sure. I think I made it through the first couple chapters and lost it at some point, but I should probably get back to it. Yeah, same. I did the same. So Yeah. Then let's get started from the beginning. First of all, before I get into the topic of pricing and, and SaaS. We would like to know a bit more about you, and we would like if you could tell to the audience um, who is Rob these days, um, what do you do, and how did you end up doing what you do today? My name is Rob Litterst. I am the head of strategy and operations for HubSpot's newsletter network. And just to put that in context, when HubSpot acquired The Hustle, which is a business and tech newsletter that goes out daily, it really kind of was this inciting incident that caused the company to start this kind of wider media function within HubSpot's marketing organization. And so within HubSpot Media, we have kind of four content pillars or four channels of content that we think about. They're blogs, newsletters, podcasts, and YouTube. So those are kind of like our four staple channels that we're constantly thinking about. And across the four of them, we're always trying to think about three main things. We're trying to figure out how can we grow our reach? And we track reach by unique impressions or unique views across all of our different channels. We think about how can we grow our audience? And when we say audience, we mean subscribers. So for podcasts, it might be people that are following our shows. For YouTube, it's people that are actually subscribing to our channels. And of course, for newsletters, it's people that are subscribing to our newsletters. And then lastly, we think about demand, which is the one, the one that's closest to HubSpot and I think the most intricately linked with the HubSpot business. And that's where we're really trying to generate leads for HubSpot. And some channels are better than others for that. Our blog has been a very consistent producer of leads. And so what we're really trying to do is figure out how we can supplement what we've been doing with the HubSpot blog for years with this great inbound marketing strategy that's been going on forever with some of these other channels where people are starting to get their news and insights these days. And so my job is really to help. I oversee growth and demand for our newsletter channel, essentially, which is four newsletters today. It's The Hustle. We have an email for business builders called Trends. And then we have a marketing email called The Lead and a sales email called The Pipeline. We are often looking to launch new ones, but th those are kind of the four that we have right now. And my goal is really to grow those newsletters and then figure out how we can generate demand for HubSpot through them. So it's really kind of a matter of building up that audience, figuring out what that audience is interested in, what they like, and then finding content offers from HubSpot that those people kind of where they are and what they're looking for. So finding the right offers and the right content for the right people at the right time is, has been kind of the easiest way to explain what we've been trying to do. Wonderful. It sounds like a good mission. And what is interesting in your particular situation, let's say, is that before joining HubSpot, you already had your newsletter, right? So the this newsletter, Good, Better, Best, emerged right before you joined HubSpot. So could you tell a bit more about that situation and your transition to become a writer and why you even decided to become a writer and create your newsletter and then also why you decided to dedicate it to such a topic as pricing. Absolutely. So I've had kind of a windy road career in the world of SaaS. So this is my second time working at HubSpot. The first time I worked here, I was working in sales. So I was in sales at HubSpot for about four years. And then I went to a few different startups and different sales and account management roles. And then I landed at a SaaS company called ProfitWell that does pricing consulting and SaaS billing metrics for SaaS companies. And so my job at ProfitWell was really to help SaaS companies, whether it was startups, scale-ups, or Fortune 500 companies, really kind of master their pricing strategy. It was by far my favorite job that probably still, like when it comes to actually doing the work and just like 
being obsessed with it. I absolutely loved that job. It was just so much fun. We got to talk to amazing founders and learn so much about their business, learn so much about their challenges. And it really honestly felt like kind of getting this crash course MBA like every single week on different kind of levers within SaaS and different types of models within SaaS. So I absolutely loved the work. I've always loved to write. I think when Substack came along, I'd already been thinking about writing a newsletter. And one of my favorite newsletters has always been Ben Thompson's Stratechery. I love Stratechery. It's one of my favorite reads. I'm pretty religious about reading every single thing he puts out. I listen to his podcasts. I, ever since finding Stratechery, I'd always kind of like wanted to figure out, can I build my own little like micro Stratechery type thing and have my own little corner of the internet? And I studied screenwriting in college. So like writing is kind of intricately tied into my personality and, and my interests. So when I'd gotten to profit well, I'd been working on a few screenplays that were, they were keeping me interested. I really liked it, but a screenplay isn't real. Like I'm not really tied into Hollywood and I have a few friends that write out in California, but like, it's hard to get feedback on like whether or not the screenplay is any good. And then like, I think this is a total rabbit hole, but like what's going on in Hollywood right now and AI is kind of crazy. So I, this all wasn't happening back when I was writing, but I had this thought, I was like, I should probably start writing something that's a little bit closer to my day job and a little bit more in sync with what I'm actually doing. And I should probably try to write something that allows me to get feedback quickly so I know whether or not what I'm writing is any good or not. And I started Good, Better, Best when I was at ProfitWell as a way for me to kind of study the pricing strategies of other SaaS companies, learn from them and be able to share examples with my clients. And then inevitably, as I was working with clients, all of these other challenges and questions would come up and that would kind of set me on like a new path of research. So it was this great flywheel where my clients would bring up things that they were working on and I would start doing research on that and those would kind of inform what I was writing about. And then every time I wrote about those types of things, I would do a bunch of research and it would give me all these examples that I could bring back to my clients. So when they were talking about, you know, should we go this way or this way with our packaging strategy? I would say, well, you know, like this company did this. I think it really worked for them. Here's how you guys are different. This is what you could do instead. And I think it made me a lot better at my job. The side benefit of that is I actually was able to build up a modest audience with it. So it's still nothing crazy. Like when I started Good, Better, Best, like Lenny started, I think a little bit before me and his newsletter now is obviously a rocket ship. It's insane how big it is. And like Packy McCormick had started Not Boring. So like compared to those guys, I have absolutely no subscribers, but I'm also writing a very niche newsletter about a very niche topic. I've been able to build up this modest audience and the, the folks from The Hustle were some of the first people to subscribe. And so I'd gone back and forth with them quite a bit and they had been trying to recruit me to come over to their team as a writer I loved my job at ProfitWell so much that I just, I wasn't really interested. Then they got acquired by HubSpot and this entire kind of situation of like building a new media company within a SaaS company became super, super interesting to me. I eventually came over to join the team and haven't really looked back since. Well, this is a super interesting journey. And I think what resonates to me in writing is this creative aspect of it. So we, with Oscar, we both have this design background. Our day-to-day -day job is already like connected to this creative vibe. And if you are a salesperson or anybody else, probably you, you need a little bit of more creativity in day-to-day -day and writing is a great way to introduce that, especially what you've mentioned that it helps you systemize your knowledge. You can share this in a very digestible format afterwards with your clients or a network. And I think it's very rewarding. So I also recently started doing that. So I totally can resonate to what you've just mentioned. And this is interesting that it helped you build this path towards your role at HubSpot. How did you even get this? Because as far as I understood, you haven't been a writer or you haven't been in this role at all before you got into that at HubSpot. So how did you manage to get this job and start doing that in such a skilled company? So I totally, first of all, I love your newsletter already, Kate. So keep it going. <laughs> um, second Thanks. of all, I think, yeah, a really underrated part of writing that I didn't realize before I started writing regularly is that it really 
helps you pressure test your own thinking and help you understand things a lot better. Like I think I had this misconception before I started writing regularly that, you know, I would go into these posts with a fully formed idea that was fully baked and like would know exactly what I wanted to write. And if I wasn't at that point yet, I shouldn't start writing. And then when I started the newsletter and had to publish something every week, I realized very quickly that you have to start writing and like get somewhere pretty fast. And I think once you start writing, you'll start doing more research, you'll start digging in, you might have one perspective on something, but then when you start digging into it, you realize that what you originally thought might not be totally true. And I think that's one of my favorite parts about it is you just end up learning a lot. You end up changing your perspective on things and having a lot of information that can help support your new perspective on it. As far as how I got the job, so the first person who from The Hustle who subscribed to my newsletter was a guy named Trung Fan, and he's now like got just a massive audience on Twitter. He's probably the funniest person I follow on Twitter. He's building his own little media empire. I mean, he almost has like a million Twitter followers, so he's like huge on Twitter at this point. But he started subscribing to the newsletter. Me and him started going back and forth, and at one point, he was like, you should come to The Hustle and write for us. And I was like, eh, I don't know. Like, I really like what I'm doing. But I was like, I don't know, I'll, I'll take the meeting and like, I'll see where it goes. And I ended up really, really loving his manager is this guy, Brad Wolverton, who runs all of editorial now for HubSpot Media. And me and Brad just hit it up. We got along really, really well. Me and Trong already got along really well. I was like, all right, like I could actually kind of see doing this. But they, they obviously were like, you know, you write this newsletter. We need to see if you can actually write for the hustle. And so they had me do, I think I did 10 different freelance briefs for them. Like I, I would basically write, like pick a topic and write a brief that would be thrown into the Hustle's daily newsletter. I think I did about 10 of those and they paid me for those. They have like kind of a, a steady rate for like what they'll pay freelancers. And I think once they had seen that enough, they had a feeling that I would be able to do it on a regular basis. And again, it took a little bit of time from there to, to get me on board full time. But I think... Like I saw a recent tweet from Alex from Morning Brew and he was talking about how like the contractor to full time should pipeline should be kind of like the default setting for how people hire. And that resonates with me. I do think it's real. I think Linear does something similar, another SaaS company where like they have people like basically try out with the team for like a few weeks and like actually do a few projects and everybody gets a sense of whether or not it'll work. That worked out really, really well for us because it really gave me a sense of like what the work would be like, what the team would be like, and whether or not I would actually like it since it was such a career shift. I mean, I was basically doing like management consultant type work and came over to start writing full time. And since then, I mean, I, I've moved over to the business side of things and I'm obviously not writing the daily newsletter anymore, but that experience has really informed kind of how I think about my current job. What you find when you go into media is there just aren't a ton of people who have been on both the editorial side and the kind of audience development and business side. So it's been a, a massive advantage, I think, for helping me think through this stuff, figuring out like what we should do next. Well, yeah, interesting. And maybe we can talk a bit more about companies and the approaches to different things and the yeah. contractor to full-time approach resonates a lot as well, I think. And yeah. It's for both sides. It's very interesting strategy to make a longer-term commitment. However, getting back to this topic on newsletters, there is a concept or there is a trend right now with this employee-generated content. Is it? And you know, there is like user-generated content, different types of content. Sometimes I think there is a problem with finding the space for that or even an interest for that inside big companies. Sometimes people start doing their content on the side, but then probably they are shifting their focus to that, let's say, to their LinkedIn profile or vice versa. But employee generated content could really boost the business growth probably. A hundred percent agree. What do you know about this and what is your opinion on that trend? Yeah, I think it can be very, very powerful. And I think it's hard because I think incentives kind of dictate everything and often employees aren't incentivized to create content on behalf of their company from their current role. Like it, it's extra work it, and it is work. Like I write LinkedIn posts pretty regularly. I write a weekly newsletter. I do like the vast majority of that in the morning before my son wakes up when I have like a little bit of time. But it's really hard to carve out the time and the space. And if you're not getting compensated for it, I think the motivation can be really hard to come by. So you have to be in a situation where 
you're either getting incentivized to do it or you just have the right team and culture, I think, to support it. Somebody who's doing this really well right now, I think, is um, Active Campaign with uh, Casey Hill, who's on their growth marketing team. He's really kind of rallied their entire team to start posting more on LinkedIn and start kind of building their thought leadership. And I think what he's doing is very smart because to your point, it really kind of helps you establish experts on your team. And I think this was all kind of born out of like the founder-led sales approach and kind of founder content approach that you see all the time. It's so pervasive on LinkedIn and so many SaaS founders are some of the most followed people on LinkedIn and have really made that content like a huge part of how they attract new customers, pressure test their company mission, all that sort of stuff. I really think in general, like if I have one takeaway from writing myself and participating in content, I think the downsides are so limited. I think it's really the type of thing where there's honestly only upside to doing it. When it comes to actually like employee generated content, I think if you're going to try to like, I haven't seen a ton of companies do what Active Campaign is doing, which is like really kind of coordinating it and being really thoughtful about who's writing what, when they're writing it, who's writing about certain topics. That's really interesting. And I think that could really gain steam and pick up because I think more than ever, people are starting to trust individuals over institutions. And the more and more you can kind of foster that within your team, I think the better. But the other interesting side of that is like a lot of people that are interested in content have their own kind of content thing going on the side and they might not necessarily want to interrupt that with publishing company content, right? So it's this interesting balance. I think Miro did it. Like, I don't know. I didn't work at Miro, but I've seen like, I know you, Kate, have done a ton of awesome content. Elena obviously is a superstar. And I've seen a bunch of other folks from Miro really blow up with content. It seems like you guys really understood it. I'm not sure if there were incentives in place to help with that, but if not, it's really impressive anyway, what you guys have been able to do. I think it's beneficial for both sides, right? Like Elena is sharing a lot of good content and it helps like to promote the brand in the end, right? To the relevant audience, to the relevant network. And maybe getting back to companies, I think HubSpot is one of the companies that introduce these newsletters and these these activities very early in the business. If you would think about your advice to companies who are early in their journeys, what would you tell them in terms of introducing newsletters to maximize its ROI or to maximize the potential of it? Does it make sense to invest into something like that when you are just building a product from scratch? You know, it's not necessary and you can postpone it and make it later. Yeah, I think it really depends. So I think newsletter is an extremely valuable channel because it's so intimate with the, with the recipient, right? It's in their email inbox. It's like the same place usually where they're getting emails from family members and friends and all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of this protected space. It's, it's kind of hard to get access to. And once you do, I think it can be really, really valuable. You obviously have direct connection, direct contact to these people. I think for companies that are thinking about using newsletters, the most important thing is just thinking about, I honestly think about it as like jobs to be done. You need to be solving for something with your newsletter. You need to have like a particular function or job that you're trying to do for the people on your list. So for good, better, best, my pricing newsletter, like I'm ultimately sharing frameworks to help make SaaS pricing easier for folks. And I, I share pricing trends like to show what's going on in the market so people have an easier time with that. Um, so there's kind of like a news angle and a strategy angle. I think for companies that are doing this, like you could take a similar approach there depending on your space and, and what kind of product you're ultimately building. I also think you could do kind of a simple newsletter that is focused on your own product with just tips and very simple tactics to use your product better. But the one thing that I do see a lot is I think a lot of companies underestimate the importance of the actual content and the actual editorial that's going into newsletters. Like I see some companies launch these types of things, but then the content is really lukewarm and, and not interesting. And like nobody, like it doesn't seem like anybody's really engaging with it and it doesn't seem very helpful. So I think if you're going to launch a newsletter, you need to take it seriously and you need to think about what you're ultimately trying to solve for the people that are going to be reading it. Wonderful. I love this focus on quality. It's something we are trying to remind everybody yeah. on this podcast. And also the, another one, another reminder I would probably add to that is the amount of content that we are producing every day. It's insane. Like it's a lot and we shouldn't overwhelm our customers, users with yet another news. 
And sometimes it's smart to do some digest things, some weekly updates rather than posting a lot of new stuff on a daily basis. So it's also about some ethics and the minimizing the noise. And I love this idea of connection to jobs to be done. Also now I'm like revisiting some flows of emails in different products. And I see even during the first experience, sometimes user can get 10 emails uh, during the first week. And it's insane. They haven't even adopted the product yet and they already get these emails. So I think overall in the second part of our conversation, we would like to talk to you about this topic of pricing. That is your focus and also try to get some examples of dark patterns to avoid and from the other side, good practices to try out. Passing the mic to Oscar. And um, first I wanted to ask how many newsletters are you subscribed to? That's a really good question. And I think that that goes back to what Kate was just saying. Like your inbox is going to be really crowded if you're in tech and if you're a newsletter reader, right? So like I think people that read newsletters read newsletters right so i think a lot of the people that are subscribed to one are probably subscribed to many i'm probably subscribed to about 30 or 40 at this point i mean i really only read they're probably like between five and ten that i really read regularly and the thing is like i think to your point kate with newsletters the volume i think volume can really dictate what kind of content you're putting out there. Like I, I subscribe to a couple daily newsletters, but they're very much like, they're just like links newsletters. It's like very quick links of like, here's what's going on in the world from this person's point of view. I can get through them in like 30 seconds. So it's like very easy. So like I feel very good about reading that email every day because I know I can get through it. But if it was like a daily email that was like a 2000 word post about something, I mean, I read Stratechery because I like really love Ben Thompson's analysis, but I just don't really see other newsletters like I, there's only so much time in the day right so it's like something there are trade-offs and something's got to fall off if you're gonna start reading another newsletter so i just i wanted to reflect on that because i think your point about quality is super super important there's just a deluge of newsletters now and it's something we try to think about at hubspot all the time but yeah to, to answer your question oscar i think it's probably 30 or 40 and that's actually way less than it used to be i think i was over 100 at some point i've, I've gone on kind of an unsubscribing spree over the last few months just because it was getting kind of crazy. I do have a filter in Gmail. So I am kind of like an inbox zero psychopath. Like I have like a very clean inbox and I have like this newsletter filter, only two newsletters avoid that filter and it's Stratechery. And I don't know if you guys know of Puck News, but it's just kind of a, it's this independent entertainment news, newsletter and podcast company. And I love what they put out as well. So I, those two get, get, prominence in the uh, inbox. Otherwise, my other newsletters are all going into this folder. And I check it a few times a day to see what's coming through. And I, I often end up reading a bunch of them, but I've cut down that number quite a bit recently. That's quite interesting, right? I'm subscribed to around 10 and I think I read two. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, it's it's very hard. It's a lot of effort. Like if I'm product design thinking, it's, wow, like you're asking someone to subscribe to read content. When I'm designing um, UIs, I'm like trying to make the content as simple and minimal as possible because I, I know most of them won't read anything. And and it's, you know, it's like you're as asking them to subscribe to content, which is quite interesting. Anyways, let's move forward. You have the newsletter, Good, Better, Best, right? Yeah. In there, you've done pricing, checkout studies. You've done research, uh, shared lots of content about it. And I wanted to ask about the dark patterns. What are the worst dark patterns that you have seen in nowadays, e-commerce, SaaS products, anywhere? Yeah. So I think like the first things that I typically think about, like they go back to like two of the biggest players in tech, I think two public companies, Airbnb and Amazon. So Airbnb obviously has this like slew of fees that they tack on, like after you actually click on a listing that you want to book. And so the price that you saw for the listing ends up being like multiplied, you know, sometimes like more than doubled because of these fees. So that's something that I don't necessarily think happens as often in SaaS, but I think in marketplaces like, you know, something like Ticketmaster or StubHub or like things like that where you're booking events, like that can obviously happen and I think as transparent as you can be around that, the more transparent you can be the better, but I I do have some sympathy for the folks that are dealing with that. Like I've I've heard Brian Chesky talk about this and it's something that they've really thought about at Airbnb and have tried to figure out. And I think the issue is 
if they incorporate all of those fees into their list price, then they end up looking so much more expensive than all of the competitors. And it's like everybody's kind of doing the exact same thing. So it's really hard for them to break away from it. So from that perspective, I kind of get it. Amazon, I, I literally just read something yesterday. I don't know if you guys read Alex Kantrowicz at all. I think his newsletter is called Big Technology. It's really good. And he had a former Amazon employee talk about the cancellation flow for Prime. And it's like Prime subscribers have to jump through a million hoops to actually unsubscribe. And I think those sorts of dark patterns are really just, not only are they kind of immoral and unethical, but they're also just so annoying. And I, especially with a company like Amazon, whose entire premise is like, were the most company or customer centric company in the world, it really is at odds with their entire mission. And I think that actually applies too to newsletters, honestly. Like some newsletters make it so hard to unsubscribe. And I'm always just so turned off when I see that sort of a unsubscribe flow. But to get into some of the juicier stuff, so I think with SaaS companies, I do think SaaS companies have gotten more transparent with their pricing over time. I think they realize that if they don't and they do something that's really unethical in a lot of cases they're going to get blown up on social media and like it's not going to be a good look and so i, th I think most SaaS companies that the three of us have heard of and used i think are, are probably indexing more towards the best practices side but there are still things that i've seen like one of the biggest trends that i've seen over the last year i'm building alongside good better best i'm building a product called pricing SaaS with a co-founder and one of the things that we do is we track pricing pages and track the changes and one of the things that we've seen a lot is companies will essentially add a new list price to their pricing page and then cross it out to make it look like the price is a discount but like, so like for example like say companies charging 100 dollars for their professional plan the change would be they'll add a 200 dollars price for the professional plan, cross it out and make it look like that's a 50% discount. So not necessarily a dark pattern, but like kind of unethical and kind of silly. And it's this kind of concept of like being a fake discount. And I think companies have been doing that for a while, kind of here and there, but it's it's become more popular. I think in the last year, SaaS companies have really started prioritizing profitability. Another one that's less of kind of like a pricing page thing that I have seen is kind of trying to reverse engineer a value metric and, and reverse engineer a usage-based pricing tactic. And so like a, a value metric for those that are not super deep in SaaS pricing is basically the unit that you charge for. And so what I've seen companies do is essentially give away their product for free for years to drive acquisition, to get this big customer base, then go back into their install base and try to apply these new usage-based metrics and these this new usage-based pricing that in some cases will significantly amplify their spend on the product. And so that's not necessarily a dark pattern that happens in the checkout flow or something like that. But it's something that I think is really kind of like a tailwind of not focusing on pricing early, kind of realizing that you have to go back and figure out how to monetize your customer base. So it's kind of like a desperation play, honestly. But that can be, I think, really negatively, like have a really negative impact on customer sentiment. And obviously on the customer base, I mean, if you have a lot of free customers who are now being asked to pay like five grand a month or something like that, then you're probably going to lose a lot of them. Those are a few that I've seen lately. I completely agree with you that products need to be ethical with the user base. Otherwise you can win in, on the short term, term by tricking them, <laughs> but in the long run, they going to all just say goodbye. Spot on. And the thing is Amazon prime subscription another another fact about it is i have it here in spain but then when i moved to netherlands it wasn't working there so i had to hire a new amazon prime subscription so it also only works for one country i was wondering why if you're like international company like what why i need to have like a different account of amazon prime in a different country right yeah that's interesting another note about this we are about to be on a black friday Friday, right? Yeah. Um, it's big time for newsletters, big time for, for pricing pages. I don't know. What's the most crazy strategy you've seen on a Black Friday strategy? What, what I've seen in terms of not being ethical is that many times they say that the price is 50% off, but then if you actually look at the price when it's not Black Friday anymore, that wasn't true. So they raise the price, then bring it down. And that happens everywhere, actually, in many, many marketplaces. But yeah, I want to hear about you. 
Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't seen anything too crazy like that in the world of SaaS. I've definitely seen some really big discounts popping up recently in the world of SaaS, especially kind of like consumer products. Like I think Shutterfly just added a big discount to kind of like the banner of their website that I would imagine has something to do with Black Friday and is probably going to be amplified before Black Friday. I think a lot of those sorts of companies that are dealing with consumers who they know are price conscious are probably going to test those sorts of things. Yeah, but the Black Friday, so I, I see a lot of that in the B2C space. I haven't seen it as much in the B2B SaaS space just because I feel like it could be so detrimental for for like future revenue. It's like all your cousins, if you do some crazy Black Friday deal, then all your co- all your prospects are just going to wait until Black Friday the following year to buy. You even see those patterns, I think, in normal SaaS all the time, like end of quarter, which is super interesting. But as far as Black Friday goes, yeah, I... The things that I'm seeing are, are more on the consumer side. And honestly, nothing as crazy as like teasing a 50% discount and then pulling pulling the rug on somebody. That's that's really wild. I hope Black Friday doesn't become a black pattern. <laughs> yeah, me, same here. On that note, maybe we can shift focus to the light side. Yeah. Positive side of things. And remember if there are any good practices, best practices in pricing, Maybe it's some strategies that just were used to make it more transparent because I believe the dark patterns are usually coming from untransparent situations when users are not aware of what is happening. One of the recent examples was from growth.design case study on GoDaddy when they are adding on top of like just basic package something extra to protect you from hackers. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something transparent. It's not something understandable for end users. Anyways, maybe there are any good practices that you've seen and you could share with us. Yeah, I think the GoDaddy example is really interesting. I almost think it's similar to Airbnb where they, like anytime you buy a domain, even from like Namecheap, which I think probably has less of the uh, crazy add-on fees, but I think either of those, like you go through the checkout process and all of a sudden there are like three or four line items that you didn't even know were there in the first place. So that's actually a really good example. I think on the positive side, you and I have talked about SNCC before. I think what they're doing on their pricing page is one of the coolest examples of innovation in pricing that I've seen in recent years. And for those that haven't seen it, they have essentially a customizable pricing page where you can essentially click a drop out, drop down button and pick your team size. You can click on like different products that you actually want to add to it and customize how much you want to use those. And it'll calculate your price as you're actually making those changes, which is really amazing. And I think super, super transparent. I do see, like, I think transparency is super, super important. I do think a lot of the folks that I talk to in the pricing space tend to over index for two things that I don't necessarily think are always need to be true. Like, I don't always think you need to show your pricing. Like, I think about like really high ACV SaaS companies, like companies like Workday or like Ultimate Kronos Group or like these big like like SAP type companies that have multiple modules that are super expensive and you know what you're getting into when you're starting with them. Like those companies, I don't even think it makes sense for them to have public pricing because the way that people are going to use their products It's going to be so dynamic and so dependent on what they're looking for. So that's one thing. The other thing is complexity. I hear people talking a ton about how pricing needs to be simple, and I don't necessarily think pricing needs to be super simple. I think transparency and fairness is important, but I think complexity is totally warranted in some cases if the model makes sense. And I think like that's probably tough for a PLG company because you don't have anybody on your website like kind of chiming in to explain it. But when you have a sales-led motion or you're layering sales on top of PLG and your sales team can actually explain what the model is based on and why it's scaling in certain ways. When I was working in sales at HubSpot, I wouldn't call HubSpot's pricing model the simplest pricing model. We would walk our prospects through like, here's what you could get at this level. Here's why you might want to be at this level. Here's why it might make sense for you to actually go into the higher plan. I think simplicity can actually be a little bit overrated sometimes. As far as best practices, like, I think about pricing pages. I actually just wrote a newsletter about this today. I think about pricing pages and just pricing in general, usually through kind of like four lenses that and kind of four departments that have been most relevant to my experience. So like anytime I look at a pricing page, I am trying to look at it through the lens of product, marketing, sales, and success. So from the product side, I'm trying to make sure, does each package actually 
have enough differentiation to be worth existing? Like, are, is that is each package actually warranted? From the marketing perspective, is each package actually designed for somebody? Like, does it actually fit a target customer? And kind of along with the product side, like, are all of your packages relevant and necessary? Or are you just kind of like throwing packages in there that don't really matter? From the sales side, are there distinct calls to action where an interested prospect can take the next step and kind of move further down the funnel? And then from the success side, is it easy to see how pricing actually scales and goes up as you grow? And again, like going back to the complexity, simplicity thing, I don't necessarily think it's 100% necessary that a prospect can see exactly what they need to pay on your pricing page, especially if they're going to go through sales. But I think they should be able to get in the neighborhood or the ballpark and have a solid understanding of like, this is, this is kind of what I'm looking at. And I might need to pressure test this a little bit, but those are kind of like the four axes that I typically look at on a pricing page to get a sense for where there might be room for improvement. Super. Makes makes total sense. Yeah. And now then that we're here, what are the trends that you've seen on 2023 in pricing pages? If you have noticed like any new trends, like maybe it will be nice to talk about them. Definitely. And probably when we will publish it, it will be already 2024. Maybe you could also, you know, do some analysis and tell us what you think, uh, what will be happening in 2024. Maybe there's some assumptions that you have. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I mentioned fake discounting, and I think that's kind of been a trend, but not the biggest one. I think the biggest things that I've seen and the biggest theme that I've seen is SaaS companies are trying to push for profitability. And so I think they're looking for different ways that they can do that and they can extract more from customers for the value that they're giving. And so I think some of the biggest themes that I've seen, I've seen a lot of companies get rid of their freemium plan, just fold freemium altogether, I guess, because it was cannibalizing revenue, which I totally understand. I've seen a lot of companies lower the usage limits in different plans to essentially try to drive more upgrades, I think, and, and push customers into the next package. I've seen a lot of companies raise prices. I think that's been a pretty pervasive theme in 2023. And I've seen a lot of plan consolidation. So going from four plans or packages to three plans or packages in an effort to try to drive people up to the next package and realizing maybe that one of those packages wasn't absolutely necessary and was weighing down the average revenue per customer. Those are some of the things that I've seen this year. I think going into 2024, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if we keep seeing a lot of the same. I do think people are being a lot more thoughtful about freemium than they used to be. And I also think to a certain extent, like part of it is cyclical. Like I think we'll probably see people roll back freemium, but then what's going to happen is there are going to be all of these markets where nobody offers a freemium plan and some new player is going to come in with a freemium plan and start driving acquisition. I think it naturally starts like kind of self-correcting and it ends up being cyclical, but I could totally see that happening in 2024. I also don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for companies to get rid of freemium. I, I've obviously seen a lot of companies succeed with it, but I do think a lot of products are actually a better fit for a free trial. And I think especially if you have a product that might require a little bit of help and a little bit of assistance to get value, and you have either like the sales or account management team to help a customer get value out of it and actually support a trial. And if your product has loss aversion incorporated into it, so like if you're helping a company get a bunch of new data that they'll find really valuable, or if you're helping them like build a new workflow that they're not going to want to let go of. I think free trials can actually be super, super powerful. And in, in that situation, it's like freemium, you're usually limiting it based on functionality or something like that, or usage. With a free trial, you're just limiting time. And so there's obviously kind of inherent urgency baked into that. And I think if you have the sales motion to support it, a free trial can be way more powerful. I don't see a as many SaaS companies as I would think, like really leveraging sales supported trials in a really smart way. And I saw that be so successful at HubSpot. Some of the best reps I knew, you know, were the types of people who weren't like banging the phones all day. They had, you know, five to 10 really highly qualified prospects in trials that they were guiding them through. And they had set expectations and milestones. And it was like, you know, if this and this and this happens by the time, you know, you get through the trial, like we'll move forward and get you started. Like, I think it can be a really, really powerful muscle to train, but it's, it obviously takes some experience and time for sure. You know what I realized the other day? Are you subscribed to YouTube premium? I am not subscribed to YouTube premium. I have been so tempted. I've thought about it a million times. 
I honestly, my son loves watching basketball on YouTube. And so, and the ads obviously drive us crazy. So I've definitely thought about it from that perspective. Then do you use Android or iOS? iOS. Do you have anyone at your family with Android? Nobody in my family is Android. We're, <laughs> we're an iOS crew, I guess. I am 99% sure that if you go to the pricing page of YouTube, the price is different if you're using Android versus iOS. That's super interesting. That was crazy to me. I was having this discussion. I just subscribed because, yeah, the advertising was driving me crazy. I couldn't stand it anymore. And I was with a friend and I was, yeah, with YouTube is quite expensive, mate. Come on, it's 14 euros or 16 euros a month. And he was, what? I'm paying 11. That's crazy. He was like, look, this is the pricing page for Android. And I was, this is the pricing page for iOS. And it's the same, but the price, the price changes. That's crazy. Wh which one was more expensive? I would think they'd be charging a premium for iOS, but is that? Of course, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's what I would have figured, yeah. That's wild. Of course. That's wild. Let's see what will be happening in 2024 with the AI and all other things, probably. I noticed that many times with like Booking.com, for example, because I'm from Netherlands and like Booking knows everything about me, probably I've seen higher prices than other folks from other countries. So basically, this is like sort of smart personalization and customization that can turn out to be quite disappointing if you reveal these strategies and again it's all about transparency and building trust with users unfortunately you probably have profit well to blame for some of that i think like what a lot of the studies that they did found higher willingness to pay for pretty much everything in the nordic region and not necessarily sure if amsterdam's considered nordic but that neck of the woods tends to have higher willingness to pay i think than a lot of places do <laughs> so sorry about that no hundred percent hundred percent Let's move forward with the last one from my side. I want to talk about subscription models. We've seen the rise of subscription models in the last, I don't know, 10 years. For me, it will be since I first started using Spotify when they started, then I started to realize, oh, there is this trend where products are struggling to have this subscription model, which is different than, I don't know, if I was designer and I was using Photoshop, I would pay one-time fee and that will be it, right? Or other software. Um, and nowadays, it's hard to think about softwares that, that you can pay once and you can use forever, right? Nowadays, it's like this subscription model and companies have as a target the ARR, and that's how the world works at the moment. So my question here is, what do you think is going to be the next big trend on that? So we went from one only purchase to this subscription where we have our chain and we, we are paying every single month. And then what's going to come next? So I think... I honestly think kind of the the next iteration from subscriptions already kind of happened and then settled down a little bit. Like I think usage-based pricing blew up quite a bit over about probably like two or three years ago. And then what you saw during the last couple of years is we had a market downturn in the United States. People saw how quickly and easily their customers can ramp down usage and it immediately has an impact on your revenue and pretty much all the metrics that you're looking at there. So I think people have kind of started self-correcting there and realizing that it makes it, it makes sense often to have kind of a combination of both. And my personal favorite pricing model is one that has a subscription fee and then some aspect that's correlated with usage, whether that's, you know, like the HubSpot model where you have a certain number of email contacts that are incorporated into your plan, or it's something like Shopify where you pay a base subscription fee and then you pay a certain rate on all the transactions that run through the store. I think those can be really powerful models. I do think there will be a trend around like one-time payments and services coming back. I don't necessarily think it's going to be become like the new normal, but I think one thing that seems to be happening both as SaaS companies have started belt tightening and with the emergence of AI is companies are getting leaner. They, they're starting to see what they can do with less people, right? And when you have less people, I think when you're using different SaaS products, getting more support and services from the products that you use regularly becomes more important because it helps you use the product better, it helps you operationalize it, and it helps you kind of embed it into your processes. I think similarly on the other side of the equation, like we talked about earlier, there are more SaaS companies than ever, and there are less and less ways to differentiate. And I think really investing in services and like really being able to support your customers is a way that companies are going to be able to differentiate quite a bit. And I think the best way to charge for that in a lot of ways, especially if it's like implementation and onboarding type stuff is a one-time fee, or you could always 
make that more of a subscription, right? And have more of an ongoing, um, high touch account manager model that I think could be super interesting. So I wouldn't expect the subscription model to go away anytime soon. I think people are, people love it for a really good reason, but I, I do think people are going to get more creative with some of the other kind of adjacent strategies that you can use with subscriptions. This is interesting. Thanks for sharing and uh, looking forward to see what 2024 will open up for us in terms of pricing and uh, subscription models. So I think we are getting closer to the end of this episode and we are so grateful for having you today, Rob. Maybe just as a tradition, we will ask you some questions <laughs> at the end. Awesome. And as we just finished this discussion about subscription models and SaaS, what was your most expensive SaaS purchase and why you converted? <laughs> because I think it's something interesting for me to uncover as an individual, how you even was willing to pay and the willingness to pay and what was the motivation there? So that's such a good question. So I do not pay for a lot of SaaS in my personal life, like for myself. So I do not really subscribe to many SaaS products now. I use like LastPass, obviously. Like I think I have a subscription with um, Google for like Gmail storage and stuff like that. But I obviously subscribe to some consumer stuff like Netflix and Spotify and all that sort of stuff. I think the most expensive SaaS product I subscribe to right now is ironically HubSpot. Um, through the company pricing SaaS that I'm building, we needed a CRM, we needed a place to store our contacts. And even we actually have the HubSpot for startups discount. And even with that discount, it's still the most expensive thing that we're subscribed to. And now I get to kind of use HubSpot from the customer side and see all of the, like every time you want to use something, there's an arrow to upgrade. And I'm like, okay, I, I see how they're doing this. But other than that, I think I subscribe to a decent amount of content. I'm trying to think I, I subscribe to Calendly personally which is one that I think is super, super valuable if you're taking a bunch of calls and meetings. I actually did buy my productivity app things, but it's actually a one-time fee. And I think they have, they're totally missing out. They could be charging a subscription. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this app. It's just called Things. It's a to-do list app. Yeah. And it's awesome. It's it's like incorporated with the getting things done method methodology by this guy, David Allen. And it's just an awesome app, but it's, it's a $50 one-time fee that I paid for that. So I, I've mentioned Calendly. I've thought a lot about, there's this productivity app called Sunsama that I've played around with a little bit. And it's kind of a combination of like a to-do list and calendar app. And it's really, really cool. I think it's about 15 bucks a month, but I haven't pulled the trigger because I have a pretty good workflow right now. And it would take me some time, I think, to adjust to it. But yeah, I think those are probably the most expensive ones. I'm, I'm pretty cheap when it comes to SaaS in my personal life. However, you mentioned so many products already. So yeah, maybe not. You have so many newsletter subscriptions and product subscriptions. So my second question on this lightning round was actually about your favorite newsletter. Probably you've mentioned 10 or 20 newsletters today on the episode. We will try to maybe add a short list of top five from everything you've mentioned, but maybe one that really, really stood out. Uh, recently. Yeah. So Stratechery is definitely my favorite newsletter. It's Ben Thompson. It's awesome tech analysis. I honestly find it indispensable. It's really, really helped me at work and it's really helped me just kind of wrap my head around what's going on in the world of tech. So that would probably be my favorite newsletter. I can give you more. Like I, I definitely have a few that I, that I read like every single time. James Clear's newsletter, what's he call it? 321 about habits is amazing. I read it every week. It's so good. That's one of those that's it's just short. You know exactly what to expect and it's so good. And then I have like a couple kind of like pop culture ones that I usually read. There's this guy, Chris Black. He hosts his podcast, How Long Gone, and he writes a column for GQ magazine called Pulling Weeds. And he sends that out via email and He's one of, I think he's one of like the funniest kind of like social critics that I follow. He's just got his eye on everything and he's he's really on point with music, film, fashion, and he's watching everything and plugged into everything. And so I love reading what he's writing and he has a really solid weekly newsletter and he actually has a uh, like brand and marketing agency, I think called Public Announcement and they have a daily links newsletter that I read every day. We will try to put all these links in description all 500 yeah <laughs> yeah 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 all right anyways thanks a lot for sharing so many useful resources names uh, names of the products names of individuals creators all of that should be a huge inspiration for not just for us but for our 
listeners. Awesome. Yeah. So thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Rob. It's been a pleasure. Thank you both. Yeah, it's been super fun. Thank you for listening. If you found it valuable, you can support Growth Mates by sharing this episode with your friends and colleagues. Subscribe to our show on your favorite platforms and get all episodes to your inbox by subscribing to kitsuma.substack.com. Let's keep growing together.